So I've created uh, what we'll say is a defect, meaning we're just getting into the knee and we look at it here. And I think especially as you get in the patellofemoral joint, like the trochlea and the, the patella especially, like Adam said, it's really, really difficult to figure out what's enough. Um, because especially in the patella, that delamination can keep going and going and going. Um, and there's oftentimes not a right answer in terms of how much or how little. And you can, you can get into taking quite a bit sometimes. Um, but then also you want to make sure that you're taking enough. One thing that I'll do is I really, I really will, especially in the patellofemoral joint where I find that the cartilage is a bit thicker, we'll look at that subchondral connection to the cartilage because oftentimes you can have some, uh, some fraying, some, a little bit of delamination on this upper surface here, but then you get down to this lower surface here and there's a pretty healthy connection to that subchondral bone. Uh, that will tell me that I'm getting to a point where I'm going to stop pretty quickly. That's very different than if I push here and there's almost complete delamination of those of that of that cartilage there. That I will start to take, even if the cartilage looks a little bit better. So to me, that subchondral attachment is um, and that the health of that subchondral bone in that area is a is a pretty important thing that I look at. Yeah, I agree. That's crucial. <clears throat> so if this is your um, supposed defect, do you ever use a, a knife then when you want to start to create your outline? I do. I think that's a, that's a good point. We don't have the right knife here. I only have a, uh, a big blade right now. <laughs> but one way, to, one way to do that is really, like Adam said, to define out along the good cartilage where you're going. And so if we're getting into really technique of defect preparation, um, I'm going to basically kind of make that line that he showed you right up here so that you can see what you would do. I, these ring curettes are really nice for that. I then come in right on top of that line right there, and it's a pretty hard push down and a pull into the defect there. And then go right next to it, push, basically push down and pull into the defect. So the goal is the, the closer, the, the quicker you can create these vertical walls, the ultimately the better off that um, you're going to be and the better the defect prep is going to be. I think starting in the middle right here, you have a tendency to end up in the middle when you're, when you're prepping from out from in and you'll get a little bit more of a hole in this area. So focusing on that rim first is, is incredibly important. And there's all sorts of different things that, that you can do for that. You know, these ring curettes are great, but sometimes depending on the angle, uh, standard curettes actually can work a little bit better. Um, I think the knife is really important, but vastly, uh, or most of the time, 80 to 85% of the time during defect prep, I'm using these. I think the other thing that's really important to, is to really get to know your varicell rep because not all ring curettes are created the same. Uh, a lot of surgery centers or hospitals will say, oh yeah, we have ring curettes or we have curettes. And uh, you come in and you say, open up the ring curettes or open up the curettes for me. And you get something that's too big, too small, super dull, um, really not what you're looking for. And if you have the right tools, this is really easy. If you don't have the right tools, it can, you just may not feel as good about it. And I think the same thing goes for when you're debriding a cartilage defect and taking your biopsy. A lot of times I ask for my elbow curettes um, because the angles are better for especially getting to the patella and a lot of times to just cartilage defects in general. So if I think somebody has a legitimate defect, I usually try to have those available for the arthroscopic portion. And then uh, the other thing that I don't know what other sizes you have, Jeff, but usually it's nice with the ring curettes to start relatively larger so that the same amount of force you put down is over a larger area and hopefully you're not going to violate the subchondral bone immediately. And then after you get the defect totally prepped, you can go to a smaller diameter ring curette or a regular curette and the same amount of force will have a lot more pressure and then you can start to remove the calcified cartilage layer, which we'll talk about too. So there you saw it. Um, Jeff was comparing some of the sizes. Yeah, so now getting into uh, removing that calcified cartilage layer and getting down what's enough, um, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, I think there's a few different things that, that you can kind of think about or that can, um, that can help. One is the sound and the feel. So once you can really, it's like scraping sclerotic bone basically. Once you're scraping sclerotic bone, you know that you're not quite deep enough yet. The other thing that you look at is some of that punctate bleeding in the bone. Once you're starting to get to that punctate bleeding, that's probably far enough. You don't need to go a lot farther. I think one thing that can be difficult to deal with where I don't know that there's a perfect answer is any sort of intralesional osteophyte. Meaning um, say that this was a cartilage defect that somebody's had for a while and that they, they've developed basically an osteophyte um, inside this this lesion right here, what exactly to do for that? Um, in the femoral condyles, they can be pretty hard and pretty, uh, pretty dense. Um, typically what I'll do is I'll start with a sharp ring curette and really try and get through it, put some elbow grease into it and try and work it there. 
Um, if that doesn't work, uh, I'm not totally opposed. I don't like to do it, but I will use a burr um, just real lightly uh, across that intralesional osteophyte if I really can't get it down to what I think is healing bone. I don't, that's kind of my last resort because I just don't like the speed and the heat sometimes generated with the burr and those defects. But I don't know, Adam, what do you do in terms of when is enough preparation for you and what you do with an intralesional osteophyte? Yeah, so the intralesional osteophyte thing is a little bit of a touchy one because I think that some people may consider a different technology altogether. And I think it just depends why the osteophyte's there, how big it is, you know, what's the true status of the bone, and, and do you feel comfortable leaving it or not. And then obviously sometimes you encounter one that you didn't expect and is smaller. And I do, I feel like the exact same as you. Usually you can use a curette. If you get to a smaller curette, again, it's usually easier to get rid of than if you stick with the bigger ones. And uh, I don't really use a burr or haven't had to with any frequency. We have a paper coming out in AJSM here in a bit about removing the calcified cartilage layer. And we had fellowship trained surgeons and essentially we were all really bad at it as far as predicting whether or not we saved it or removed it. But I think that the biggest thing is, is that if you start getting so deep that you can visually see the cancellous bone and you start to see that architecture, you're getting too far in that, in that area. And if you have a tourniquet up while you're doing this, you know, you may not think you're as deep, but that will bleed once you let it down. And that's, that's definitely not ideal. So you want to see that shiny white surface. Usually you can hear a little bit of a difference in the pitch change. And it's definitely something to work on in the lab um, to really see it start to go away. And if you're not sure you're doing it again, go to a smaller curette and then all of a sudden you'll start to see more coming down and you'll get a much better idea, but it, it's certainly not that easy. Yeah, I think the other thing that we can talk a little bit about since we're doing freehand prep here is what to do when you have a non-contained lesion, meaning something that's typically it's kind of medial femoral condyle spilling off into the, um, into the intercondylar notch or in the patella as it's going off into the side. Um, I think at least in my experience with Macy, and I've tested out some in some fairly non-contained defects that it's actually very stable with that glue just in terms of how it's put in the adherence to the subchondral membrane. I haven't had to, or the subchondral bone. I actually haven't had to use any sutures. Um, and I probably have done some that have been probably only 70%, 65, 70% contained, um, especially in the patellofemoral compartment. But for non-contained defects, for me, that's been a bit of a change from the ACI where you need to make sure that you have that watertight seal. Um, now you can really just make sure that that implant is stable and it's relatively easy to test by just cycling the knee. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, there's certainly talk about putting small anchors at the periphery if there's a significant amount uncontained or anchoring it to soft tissue with a suture. But um, again, I like you said, I haven't personally run into that, but I know people that have done that approach and we're happy with it. Yeah. So now we have our defect prep here. Um, so you could see that in the, maybe in this defect per se, or in this defect in the trochlea, this might be one where we could potentially use a standardized approach in terms of the, in terms of the implants here uh, or the instrumentation. So this might've been one that might've been good with the instrumentation, which we'll show you here in a second or two. But for this, for these purposes, in terms of uh, custom prep or basically hand prep, what I'm gonna do now is I have my foil that I'm gonna use as a membrane. Um, and again, there's one side with no writing, one side with writing. Uh, I'm gonna use the side with writing as my cell side meaning that's the side where the cells are gonna be. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna flip it over because those cells are then gonna be against that bone. Um, and there's a couple different ways. Uh, I think that each person in terms of how their, their mind works is gonna figure out what's easiest for them. But what some of the things that you can do in order to size this is you can really kind of get it in here like this and you can take uh, some uh, a freer something along those lines to really kind of push out uh, and get the idea where that's at. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to take a knife uh, right here and really get it into that defect um, and then really kind of put around the sides of it where it's at. Um, some of the other things uh, that you can do with it are you can take a uh, piece of glove paper, um, which is, uh, is going to soak up a little bit more and you're going to be able to see through that. Um, do we have a glove? So you can take a piece of glove paper uh, and put that into the defect. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna see that uh, you can basically take a marker and you can see a little bit easier, you can create that defect size a little bit easier um, right here and basically take a marker around it if you wanna do that. Um, personally, what I do, they will freehand it in terms of, uh, I'll take it, I'll bring it up to the size, I get an idea where my size is, and then I'll make uh, basically that, uh, that size just a little bit larger than what I think the actual defect is uh, so that I can trim it down in the certain areas where 
Um, I'll trim it down to certain areas where it needs to be trimmed down. Um, but again, in terms of sizing these, it's really important to, uh, to size, undersize this, if anything. You don't want to oversize this. Uh, if you oversize this, uh, this implant, um, it's going to come up on the edges uh, and it's going to catch on the rest of the, uh, it's going to catch on the rest of the joint surface. I don't know, Adam, what do you do for your sizes on your free hands? Yeah, I do. I guess like a hybrid of what you do. So I put the foil close, then I do a rough cut of a rectangle essentially, then I press that in and I find that it's just easier to manage in the joint. And then from there, I start to cut around just like what you're doing. Um, definitely want to keep it smaller. The problem, there's a couple problems with it coming up the edge, but, but one of them is that adds to the volume closer to the edge and the fibrin I think will also sit higher. Oh, Jeff, that's, that's just too good. If there was a mic, I'd be dropping it. It's too good, too good, Jeff. I'll do it for you over here. You're so proud of yourself right now. That's uh, great. No, it looks great. No, but I, I would say that even this, um, in terms of the, the size here, uh, when, with cutting out the Macy implant, I will leave my template a little bit bigger because I sometimes find that it's easier to cut into my template as I'm cutting out the Macy implant because it keeps it in place a little bit more. But um, this is a, the, the defect prep basically, and then this is creating our, um, our template for this. Do you use the uh, Telfa Tegaderm, or not a Telfa Tegaderm, but just a regular Tegaderm then uh, to place that in for cutting? To, uh, have, you the, ever, have you ever put that in? The, uh, the paper. Oh, the, the, the oh what, yeah, the paper. Um, sorry, I didn't know what you were talking about at first. I actually just use the, the back side of the, the suture container um, here. But I think the, um, the back side of the Tegaderm works fine too. Both of those work. So essentially now what you're going to do is... Um, why don't we go so that yeah jeff just to be clear it's something that i just started doing recently based on a recommendation is you li actually lay the foil into uh tegaderm so you peel up the sticky part put the foil in lay it back down and then that all stays as one unit oh gotcha yeah no i think that's uh that's a that's a great pearl i will certainly try that lee why don't we come over here so then peel mm -hmm. peel the sticky part off lay the foil in the middle of that don't take it all the way off and then close it back down. And then you'll basically lay the implant on top of that and cut around it. We'll try something new. So like this? Yep, yeah, exactly. And then okay, so again, writing is up. So I know my cell side is up and I keep repeating this to myself and everyone around it, around us. So like this here? Yeah, then you can take off that white part there. Um, okay. And then now you're all set to lay the Macy on top of it. Okay. So that way you're not trying to manage, you know, three different layers. Sure. Just two. Absolutely. So, uh, okay, so there's our implant with the writing up. Again, the cell side up. These are um, basically flat pickups with no teeth. And again, this is something that uh, you'll have all of this, but it's certainly something to make sure that your varicell rep is bringing for you because pickups are all very different too across centers. And now if we take a look at this Macy implant here, and so this would be opened this by somebody else, a circulator yeah. in the room, and then they're holding this, and then the, what's inside is sterile. Correct. So um, what I'm showing here is, again, that cutout in the left-hand corner right there. And like Adam said, this part is non-sterile. So some you, the surgeon, is going to come and take this, and you're going to take the implant out of here sterilely. Basically, two ring forceps, bring it over, and you're going to put it then on top of your, uh, on top of your implant. Just a couple little pearl or your couple of your template, a couple little pearls. Um, you want to put this uh, away. You want to kind of keep your cutout over here. So you don't want to put it right next to here so that you're cutting out uh, your orientation because if you happen to need another one, something changes, it moves. Uh, you still understand where your cell side is um, and what is not your cell side. There's a big difference um, between the cell side and the non-cell side. Uh, the cell side facing up is a much more of a rough layer uh, with the cells adherent to it, again, in a homogenous population around that. Uh, this, this side down is much more of a smooth layer. So it really creates a, a barrier between the cells, the subchondral bone, and then the rest of the, the joint fluid and the joint surface itself. So there is a big difference between the two of them. Uh, it certainly cannot be flipped. That would not work. So putting it towards one side, not necessarily in the middle, and then keeping it just off of the edge, the actual the cell populations right around the edge um, are not, uh, not necessarily as viable as in the middle. So you just don't want it right on the edge. So you just bring it in just a hair there. Next base, go ahead, Adam. Did you say something? 
No, no, you're all good. Um, so next, uh, what we also know too is from some studies looking at uh, arthroscopic um, treatment of defects with Macy implants is that this Macy implant and the cells within it actually do, just like all the other cartilage studies out there, do respond to pressure. So in terms of the amount of handling that you do to the actual implant that you're going to put in, you want to try and minimize it as much as possible. Um, so that means, uh, you know, not basically putting a lot of thumb pressure over the top of it, not necessarily holding it in place. So basically what I'll do, and again, this is something that uh, everyone probably does it a little bit differently. Um, I basically will put my thumb right, uh, right next to that implant, but not on that implant, understanding that I know that I'm damaging some of the cells in this area, but I'm not necessarily going to need them. If I do need them, I have the rest of the cells in this area. Yeah, so that's great. So as you're, you're kind of cutting that and working on it, something else that um, you're going to want to do is take the rest of the fluid that the implant came in and have that on the back table, usually in a specimen cup lid, so that you can put the rest of the implant in there um, as you're implanting it, just in case it dislodges or you have any issues. This is always a little bit of a tricky part. So again, barely touching it. Steve, why don't you come around and grab this here for me? You see how important sharp scissors are. So uh, here basically now we have that whole, we're gonna come back into the knee here. So basically you have the kind of the membrane below it, cell side facing up here. So basically I will put this down. You probably can't see that right there, but you can leave, you can stay on the knee uh, neatly and then show the defect here. There we go. Okay, so now uh, that we have our, we have our membrane and our template um, uh, or our implant set up, we want to really kind of talk about what you do in terms of the bleeding here because you can't have bleeding. I actually do these with no tourniquet and I only put tourniquet up if I'm having problems because I like to control the bleeding as I go. Uh, and I feel that um, it gives me a kind of a good idea that how deep my defect prep is. So if I see a lot of bleeding, I know, okay, I'm deep enough. And that's also not something I want once, uh, once I have that... Um, uh, Macy implant in there. The other thing at this point that I'll do is once I've gone to, if we pretend and I go back to the preparation of it, um, basically what I'll do, we don't have a lot of it here, but I'll take uh, my PA or any assistant and basically take some gel foam uh, thr uh, thrombin or some thrombin soaked gel foam and basically put it into the defect right there and then have my assistant hold that in place with some finger pressure there in order to really stop the bleeding. And I would tell you that that really does it. You know, that's, that's, there isn't too much more that you have to do. It's usually pretty clean at that point, as long as you haven't created a big cavitary defect. So once we say, okay, my tourniquet's down, uh, things look pretty dry, I'm happy with my defect prep, uh, I'm ready to put my, uh, my implant in place, I like how it's cut, basically. You then take the fibrin glue uh, that's here. And again, this is something that you want to be pretty minimal with and you come back into the knee, and this is one of the big differences is that you're putting that fibrin glue down first. Uh, there's some white paper studies that show that actually cartilage cells like fibrin glue. They tend to be a little bit more viable and a little bit happier in it. So um, uh, putting that uh, against the subchondral bone here, when we come back into the knee, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna test it out. So I'm gonna go to a part lower on the knee because once you have this open, you can sometimes get a, a hard part where it can harden at the tip of that. And the harder you push, it can all come out in one quick big thing. So what I'm gonna do is I basically will come in here and I will start in injecting, injecting, and I'll get it to the point where I, I say, okay, I have a feel for this. Each fiber and glue is a little bit different as well. So some of them are runnier, some of them are thicker. So I'll play with it a hair just to make sure that I have the, I have a good understanding of what I think that's gonna do. Once I have an understanding of what it's gonna do, I basically will get a little ball of it to the tip. Basically, I'll get a little ball to the tip there, and then I'll basically start putting it into the defect, just really slowly kind of painting it in there. You don't want it to be, you don't want it to be gobbing down. You don't want it to be running over. The idea is to hold the implant in place, but not really to, to adhere to anything else around it. So I like to describe it as kind of painting that defect. So as you're painting that defect here, I can see that it's all nice and shiny. I can see that it's not really running um, on the lower side. It's not running down here. I don't have a big gob of it over the top of it right there. And I think that that's probably more than enough in this situation. Yeah, I think that that uh, point of expressing it first outside of the defect is crucial. And you can't forget that when you go back to put it on top to do it again, because uh, it'll, it'll just put it all over the place. Right, so now basically we're gonna bring our defect up to the, or we're gonna bring our implant up to the knee. 
Um, again, remembering what side is what. You can leave it on the kneely. So I wouldn't always do this, but what I'm showing here is the implant itself. And again, I'm telling everyone around me, cells are up, cells are up, cells are up, cells are up. And then basically it's flipped over and you can see, it probably can't see on the screen there. Uh, it's not really coming up, but that's, that side is a lot smoother. And basically now I'm coming into the defect. And I'm right in there and I'm below the surfaces of the joint there below here, below there. I'm really kind of getting the air bubbles out of it, I'm getting it down into the defect. And then once I kind of have a pretty good placement of it, I'll take my thumb and just gently push it in there once or twice. I won't hold it in there um, because I'm concerned about that type of thing where you see uh, that basically I've created some ridges right there and it's actually shifted. So I like using um, really just the pickups to kind of go around and very gently just make sure that it's underneath all those surfaces um, and what you don't want and where this is where it really comes where it's pretty important um, to make sure is that uh, you don't want this up along the edges of it. Um, if, if it's up along the edges of it, it's going to create a problem going forward. Uh, and where this gets a little difficult, where it's different than ACI is the membrane before um, was very uh, kind of easy to trim because it was sitting on the top. If you look at this defect, and it's hard to see here, but you'll see it in the lab, uh, it's actually sitting in the base of that defect uh, right there. So once you say, okay, this isn't, it doesn't quite, a, quite have the stretch that the BioGuide membrane did, um, it gets a little bit difficult to trim once it's in there. Um, what you're going to find is that you're going to end up cutting kind of straight lines of it and it's not going to look pretty. So it's definitely worth your time to, go, to, to try and get in there and um, get as good of a size to that template if you can. And again, really uh, undersized, if anything, um, the cells are going to expand and they're going to they're move around. So, you know, I think undersizing is much more important because you're not going to love it if you, uh, if you have to try and cut it once it's in the defect. But um, I think overall this looks pretty good and we're going to, we would give this then three minutes at this point. So basically, uh, kind of give it three minutes to harden. And then I think one of the really important things with Macy, again, that's a bit, that's differentiating it a bit is, uh, I think we're probably hard enough to, to move forward. So once we have our three minutes, you basically can um, take everything out, kind of close, uh, you can, I'll use kind of a towel clip here, something like that. And then basically you wanna, uh, want you pan out a bit. Do like you put that. any fibrin on top? Yeah, you certainly can. And this one, we had pretty good uh, coverage or we had pretty good coverage inside the defect. So actually, if there's a, a pretty good defect, um, you don't necessarily need to, um, which I'm going to do here. I just wanna show hopefully the stability of the defect um, because it's pretty impressive. So if we take, go back into the knee um, and then grab that, yep, right there. So this uh, little thing that you're seeing right here is just a piece of cartilage that came up on top. But if you look at this, the membrane really hasn't moved at all with cycling that knee and closing it down. And that was a very, very minimal amount of fiber and glue that I put into the defect. Um, and I didn't put any around the rim. Now, like, like Adam was saying, one thing that you can do, especially in defects where uh, you feel like, hold right here, you feel like, boy, I wanna get a little bit more on there. Again, I urge you, I'm an over fiber and gluer as well, but you know, this is more of a minimal thing than anything else, is that again, you're gonna take your fiber and glue, you're gonna get that feel for how you play with it, really get a little bit of a, a little bit of a bubble at the top, and then you're gonna just take it and you're just gonna put it right around the edge just getting little bubbles of it, not really trying to inject it. Again, little bubbles all the way around the edge of it so that it's coming out. Indication for use. Macy, autologous cultured chondrocytes on porcine collagen membrane, is an autologous cellularized scaffold product that is indicated for the repair of single or multiple symptomatic full thickness cartilage defects of the adult knee with or without bone involvement. Macy is intended for autologous use and must only be administered to the patient for whom it was manufactured. The implantation of Macy is to be performed via an arthrotomy to the knee joint under sterile conditions. The amount of Macy administered is dependent upon the size, surface in centimeter squared, of the cartilage defect. The implantation membrane is trimmed by the treating surgeon to the size and shape of the defect to ensure the damaged area is completely covered and implanted cell side down. Limitations of use. Effectiveness of Macy in joints other than the knee has not been established. Safety and effectiveness of Macy in patients over the age of 55 years have not been established. 
important safety information. MACE is contraindicated in patients with a known history of hypersensitivity to gentamicin, other aminoglycosides, or products of porcine or bovine origin. MACE is also contraindicated for patients with severe osteoarthritis of the knee, inflammatory arthritis, inflammatory joint disease, or uncorrected congenital blood coagulation disorders. MACE is also not indicated for use in patients who have undergone prior knee surgery in the past six months. Excluding surgery to procure a biopsy or a concomitant procedure to prepare the knee for a MACE implant. MACE is contraindicated in patients who are unable to follow a physician prescribed post surgical rehabilitation program. The safety of MACE in patients with malignancy in the area of cartilage biopsy or implant is unknown. Expansion of present malignant or dysplastic cells during the culturing process or implantation is possible. Patients undergoing procedures associated with MACE are not routinely tested for transmissible infectious diseases. A cartilage biopsy and MACE implant may carry the risk of transmitting infectious diseases to healthcare providers handling the tissue. Universal precautions should be employed when handling the biopsy samples and the MACE product. Final sterility test results are not available at the time of shipping. In the case of positive sterility results, healthcare provider or providers will be contacted. To create a favourable environment for healing, concomitant pathologies that include meniscal pathology, cruciate ligament instability and joint misalignment must be addressed prior to or concurrent with the implantation of MACI. Local treatment guidelines regarding the use of thromboprophylaxis and antibiotic prophylaxis around orthopaedic surgery should be followed. Use in patients with local inflammations or active infections in the bone, joint and surrounding soft tissue should be temporarily deferred until documented recovery. The MACI implant is not recommended during pregnancy. For implantations post-pregnancy, the safety of breastfeeding to infant has not been determined. Use of MACI in paediatric patients younger than 18 years of age or patients over 65 years of age has not been established. The most frequently occurring adverse reactions reported for MACI greater than 5% were arthralgia, tendonitis, back pain, joint swelling and joint effusion. Serious adverse reactions reported for MACI were arthralgia, cartilage injury, meniscus injury, treatment failure and osteoarthritis. For more information or to view full prescribing information, please go to macy.com.